All right, here we are. This is uh, Matthew for Beginners. This is lesson number 11. We're uh, on chapter 19 of Matthew, famous chapter 19 of Matthew. The title of this lesson, Marriage, Divorce, Remarriage. And uh, this, uh, in our narrative discourse, you know, this is discourse, or excuse me, this is narrative number five. Okay, so Jesus' ministry in the, in the northern part of the country near um, his hometown of Galilee is complete and now he prepares to go to Jerusalem. So this particular narrative, narrative number five, divides itself into two basic sections. So one section are the events that take place while he's on his way to the city. You know, we read all the time that he was being followed by crowds, crowds were around him, Things were always going on around him as he traveled. There's that part of narrative number five. And then um, uh, Matthew describes what takes place in and around the temple in Jerusalem when he finally uh, arrives uh, in that city. So this narrative shows Jesus' reaction to people and their reaction to him. Uh, there's a lot of that in this particular, uh, particular section. Also, if you've read through, you'll note that the, there's you know, the general hostility and doubt that was in the north is even more evident, more pronounced among the leaders as Jesus enters the city and the temple area. Okay, so let's go to uh, the descent to Jerusalem and uh, chapter uh, 19, one and two. Um, and uh, if you read uh, in chapter 19, verses one and two, you'll note that his healing ministry continues to the masses as he approaches the city. And then when he gets to the city, uh, he has a confrontation with the Pharisees. And that's what I'm going to focus on uh, tonight in verses three to 15. I'm going to devote the entire lesson to this if you want to look at everything that took place in narrative number five, because there's not just this a confrontation with the Pharisees, there's more to it than that. But I want to focus on this here because there's been so much teaching and so much debate on this particular topic. I'd like to develop this, uh, uh, this tonight. So let's read chapter 19, verse three. It says, some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? So Matthew says, that this was a test, um, a test to see which side Jesus favored in the divorce issue that was raging at the time. Imagine that, this debate in the church even today about marriage and divorce, the same type of debate was raging at that time among the Jews. So they, uh, they, they test him uh, about, that particular, uh, about that particular issue and they're testing him on, a, on the meaning of a particular verse that they were debating over, and that is in Deuteronomy chapter 24. So I want, I want to read that. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse one, it says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. So based on this passage, there was a debate going on at that time. And this debate was represented by two schools of thought, two rabbis. Rabbi Shammai, when he read this, when he interpreted this, he said that the only reason um, for a divorce was shameful conduct, immorality, sexual immorality. This was the only reason that a person could divorce uh, their spouse. Of course, in Jewish society, only the men could initiate a divorce. The women could not initiate a divorce. So it's basically talking to the men. 
Then there was another rabbi, another school of thought, Rabbi Hillel. When he read this, his interpretation was, well, any cause, any cause, any displeasure that the husband had with his wife was reason to divorce her. She didn't look appealing anymore, that was a, a cause of divorce. Uh, she, uh, her cooking skills were not that great, another reason for divorce. So we would say that Rabbi Shammai had a, a much stricter, more conservative view, and Rabbi Hillel had a more liberal view on the uh, acceptable reason uh, for a divorce. So this is the question that they come to Jesus with. All right? They want him to kind of settle the dispute, but it wasn't really, a, they weren't asking him an academic question, they were asking him a question to test him, to trap him. You see, if Jesus sided with the stricter view, he could be responsible, uh, 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 he could be reproached rather, for his friendly treatment of sinners. I mean, he forgave the prostitute, uh, he moved among sinners and tax collectors and divorcees and so on. You know, he moved around a pretty rough crowd. And so if he says, no, no, I believe that uh, Rabbi Shammai is correct, well, people say, boy, you're, you know, you're a hypocrite. You know, what's going on? You, know, you have a strict view of this, and yet you hang around with sinners. If, on the other hand, he sided with the more lax view, then the Pharisees could then side with the opposite and accuse him of moral laxity. You're easy on divorce. That would be the accusation. And then, if he declared himself against all divorce, no divorce for any reason whatsoever, then they would charge him with contradicting the law of Moses, which did permit divorce. So there was no, there was no answer to this question. This was like a no-win situation. Any way he would answer, they would interpret it in such a way to come back and attack him. So let's read a little more about this passage, or a little more of this passage. It says, and he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Okay, so in responding to their question, Jesus begins by revealing the error of their thinking. That is, that God's will concerning marriage was fully contained in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses one to four. In other words, he says to them, hey, you guys are only looking at Deuteronomy you know, 24, one to four, that talks about some of the reasons for divorce, but you're ignoring Genesis chapter two which is the original law or the original teaching, the original principle about marriage. Now Pharisees, they saw marriage and its uh, dissolution, they saw it in terms of law. After all, they were lawyers. When they came up to him, they asked him the question, is it lawful? They didn't ask, is it moral? Is it right? Is it God's will? They said, is it lawful? So they wanted a kind of a legal definition. So what Jesus does when he answers them is he points them to the original and the basis for teaching concerning marriage. And that's Genesis all the way back, Genesis 2 verse 24, where God says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And so what does this passage teach about marriage? Well, first of all, it teaches that God created it as the perfect union for uh, man and woman. Secondly, um, He created it as a physical and emotional bond and one that was even stronger than the parental bond, right? Okay. I mean, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. So the, the, the husband and wife bond is stronger than the parental bond. And that to, to dissolve such a bond was to go against what God had done. And he says that, whatever God joins together, let no man separate. But here's the mistake. Jesus didn't say you couldn't, you couldn't break the bond. He said you shouldn't break the bond. In the same way like he says you shouldn't steal. But do people steal? Well, yeah. Thou shalt not murder. That's the command. But do people murder? 
Is it impossible for them to murder? Well, no, they murder, all, you know, you shouldn't lie. Thou shalt not lie, bear false witness. But do people break that command? Is it possible? Yes. Well, when it came to marriage, God said, whatever God joins together, you should not pull apart because that will be wrong. He didn't say you couldn't pull it apart. He just said you shouldn't pull it apart. Okay? Very important distinction as we go on in our, uh, in our study. So having established the basis, and the basis is, the basis for marriage, there are two scriptures, Genesis 2, that explains what marriage is. Man and a woman for life, united together, you should not break that bond, that's God's command, that's Genesis 2, and then Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4, if there is a divorce, it has to, the only cause, the only justified cause for it is the sexual immorality of one of the partners. So that's what Jesus answers. There's two scriptures here that, uh, that define marriage, okay, and that mitigate divorce. All right, so in verses seven to eight, let's keep going. They, meaning the Pharisees, they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it, ha it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So the Pharisees, assume that Moses commanded or promoted divorce. And their understanding of the entire issue is based on that premise. Notice what they said. They say to him, well, well why, did Mo, why did Moses command divorce? Well, Moses wasn't promoting divorce, but they're looking at it in that way. The reality of the matter was that Moses never changed the original teaching or the purpose of marriage, Genesis 2.24. He never changed that but rather he included legislation that mitigated. You know what the word mitigate means? It means to reduce, to tamper down. So Moses included legislation that mitigated the evil and the hardship that had occurred through the problems that were created by divorce among the Jewish people. So Genesis 2.24 was spoken when Adam and Eve were without sin. After sin came into the world, there also came a degeneration of the relationship in the couple and the family. And so what does God do? Well, God establishes a variety of means to maintain and sustain order in a fallen world until Jesus comes back to save. So what does Jesus do? How does He, how does he enter human history to try to mitigate and, you know, some of the evil? Well, the flood because the intent of man's heart was evil continuously, what does that mean? Well, if you leave him alone, man's going to self-destruct, so God enters into human history, the flood, he saves a few, starts over again. Or how about the, the Tower of Babel, when he, when he confused the languages? Once again, instead of doing what God said to separate and to spread out and you know, settle the world, the earth, and so on and so forth, what do they do? They do the opposite. They gather in one place, they build a monument, they try to, you know, come together. So God steps into human history once again and confuses their languages to spread them out. And so, uh, and what else does He do? Well, He gives the law to Moses. Why? As a tutor to prepare us for what? Well, for the coming of Jesus. So God enters into human history to try to mitigate the evil that's in the world because of, because of sin. Okay, so the legislation concerning divorce was not a change in the principle upon which marriage was based, but rather additional instruction to help deal with the failed marriages that were bound to occur because of sinfulness. And Jesus simply expresses this idea in verse eight. Divorce was failure, was sin, and this is how to deal with it. After the sin of Adam, divorce was to be part of the world and part of life, and the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses one to four, is one way that God deals with it, okay? All right, so in verse nine, verse nine he says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. 
Little bit of background, you have to understand to be able to interpret this correctly. The common practice among Jews, especially the Pharisees, was to find some pretext to send away their wives in order to marry someone else, and then claim innocence based on Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses one to four. Because they would say, well, I fulfill the law, I gave her a certificate of divorce. I did thing, everything by the book. I wanted to dispose of my wife, get rid of my wife, send her away. So I made sure that I wrote a certificate of divorce according to the quote law, and I handed it to her and I sent her away. My hands are clean. My heart is innocent. I've not done anything wrong because I've obeyed the quote law, all right? And then of course, according to Deuteronomy 24, they would not reclaim her. In other words, you weren't allowed to go back and remarry your, your wife. And they'd say, well, I didn't do that either. Okay, so Jesus comes along, when they ask him a question about marriage and divorce, he comes along and he reveals their hypocrisy by applying the principle of Genesis 2.24 to their actions as the moral indicator, not just some sort of twisted view of Deuteronomy 24. Do you understand what he does to the Pharisees? He's saying, yeah, yeah, according to Deuteronomy 24, you've kind of twisted that you know, for your own advantage to get rid of your wives. But then he points out to Genesis 2.24, it wasn't always like that. You violated Genesis 2.24. In other words, what was one, you've broken into two. This is how he nails their hypocrisy. In effect, he says, if you want to judge how lawful you are, compare your actions to a combined view of Deuteronomy 24 and Genesis 2. If you can pass muster on both of those scriptures, okay, then you have something to, uh, to uh, not brag about, but uh, a claim to some sort of innocence. So sending, the way, uh, sending away the one to whom you are joined without proper cause, and what was proper cause? Jesus answered it. He says, except for what? Fornication, fornication, sexual immorality, some sort of sexual sin. And so who does Jesus agree with as far as the rabbis? Well, he agrees with Rabbi Shammai. Because remember the original question, they said to him, can we, can we divorce for any reason? So Jesus answers the question, no you can't. Sexual immorality. And other passages of scripture in the Old Testament bear this out. Numbers chapter 5, 12, Deuteronomy 20, uh, 22, 13, Deuteronomy 24 verses one to four, and now Matthew 19, nine, all treat the subject of divorce and what is a proper cause of divorce, and all of these passages say only sexual sin. Okay, now a person can dissolve a marriage. I mean, the law permitted this, but to do so without proper reason was adultery. Okay. A lot of people teach, well, you can't divorce. Well, that's not a biblical idea. Of course you can divorce. But, it, but you can't do it without some sort of guilt. That's the, that's the problem. All right, so there's a debate on this verse, not just in our brotherhood, but you know, a lot of people debate. So let's look at the debate, shall we? The two, really two sides. There's a lot of, you know, I've read books that says the seven views of this thing, but there's really only two, really two views. The first view is what's called the adulterous marriage view. And the adulterous marriage view says that the adultery, you know, when Jesus says, if a man puts away his wife, except for uh, fornication, commits adultery, right? So one view, the adulterous view, says that the adultery is committed when the person marries again for the second time. And they call that second marriage a, quote, an adulterous marriage. Now the reason for this is that the verb in the Greek, you know, in that passage, commits adultery, is in, they say, a linear or continuous action mode. So the thinking is this, if you divorce your wife, 
except for cause of adultery and marry somebody else, that second marriage, that's an adulterous marriage. Why? Because you keep on committing adultery every time you have sex with your, your, your second wife. Okay? So that's why the second marriage is an ongoing adultery. Now, one thing we need to understand, there is no such term in the Bible as adulterous marriage. Human beings coined that term. You go anywhere in the Bible, you won't see the term adulterous, adulterous marriage. Now, this line of reasoning, okay, requires that those who have divorced without just cause and then remarried must break up their existing marriages and go back to their original spouses or remain celibate for the rest of their lives in order to properly repent of their sin. And if, the, if they're not already baptized, uh, they have to do that before they will be baptized. I mean, I've tried to summarize this argument, but this is pretty much the way the ar argument goes. So if you're in a second marriage and you want to become a Christian, according to this line of thinking, your second marriage is a, quote, adulterous marriage. Therefore, you have to break up that marriage, go back to your original partner, and if that's not possible, you just need to remain celibate for the rest of your life, and then you can be baptized. Okay? All right. Another point of view. The other point of view is that it is the breaking of the covenant which is adultery. In other words, the adultery is committed when the partner violates the marriage covenant. Now the essence of the idea of adultery is to break a covenant or to violate a promise. We always assume that adultery means sex, but adultery can mean that, but it also means the breaking of some sort of covenant. God says to His people, you know, an adulterous generation, why? It had nothing to do with sex. No, it's because they went after other gods. They were unfaithful. So in this instance, you know, what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 19, uh, in this instance, it's through sexual infidelity. In other words, the, the adultery committed, the breaking of the covenant, is done through sexual infidelity. So it's, it's been shown also that the verb in the Greek, you know, that commits adultery, because it all boils down many times to grammar. What do the words mean? So it's been shown also that the verb in the Greek to commit adultery is not necessarily a linear, denoting a continuous action, but on the contrary, according to proper translation, should be considered what we call point action or one-time occurrence. Actually, the decision on linear or point action actually belongs, uh, you, the way you decide which, it, which way it goes is according to context. And many, many, many scholars within our brotherhood, within our schools, teach this idea of a one-time action point action in this particular passage. Um, when we take these ideas together, the conclusion on this verse is that when a person violates his marriage covenant through sexual infidelity, that person commits the sin of adultery, whether he remarries or not. And it's a one-time sin. Let me put it this way. It's like stealing a car. You steal a car, right? and you bring it to your house. You, know, you steal it in Oklahoma and you bring it to your house in Dallas. Okay? And the next day you get back into, your, into the car that you stole and you drive it around. Have you stolen that car a second time? And then the next day you take it and you go to Phoenix. Is that the third time you've stolen that car? And then you come back from Phoenix. Oh, is that fourth time? In other words, do you re-steal the car every single, well, no. You steal the car once. Maybe you have it for a day or a year. You've stolen it one time. One time, one time action. Okay? So if a person divorces in order to marry someone else without proper cause, the sin that they commit in doing that is called adultery. Why? Because they have violated or broken the original marriage covenant. 
what I'm trying to explain, if I had a blackboard, you know, is that the sin happens when you break the covenant, not when you remarry. That's the point. Okay? This thinking is not being, quote, soft on divorce. On the contrary, this line of reasoning upholds, one, the principle of fidelity in marriage, because if you're unfaithful in marriage, that's a sin. It condemns any violation of the marriage covenant as adultery, but it does not consider remarriages as the adultery. After all, listen to what Jesus said. If a man puts away his wife, except for fornication, and marries someone else, he commits adultery. He didn't say the marriage was, the second marriage was adultery. He's saying if you violate your covenant, if you break the covenant, if you put away your wife for, for some other reason other than adultery, here's, here's what you've done. You've committed, you've committed adultery. Jesus never used the term adulterous marriages. So repentance, someone will say, well, what about repentance? Well, repentance from this perspective means what? Well, A, you recognize the violation. What have I done? I've broken my covenant. I've committed adultery. And what do I do about it? I ask God for forgiveness. And then what do I do about it? Well, I never do that again. <laughs> And the things that led to that, what, what are the things that may have led to that? Selfishness, self-centeredness, perhaps lust and allowing lust to grow in your heart and so on and so forth. Maybe you start working on that so that the marriage that you're in, that one you succeed at. All right, let's look at some other things here, okay? Verse 10, in the same passage, so the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. So the disciples, of course, influenced by the lax divorce laws of the time, they're dismayed. I mean, if the only reason a man has of discharging his wife is her fornication, which was a remote possibility in that day and age, <laughs> okay, then it's probably better not to marry. I mean, listen to what they said how far away they are from God's original ideal of husband and wife as partners in life, transparent and sharing and mutual giving in physical and, 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 and the emotional realm. You know, Jesus has done more for the elevation of, of women to their proper place and function at man's side than any other single person in history. So let's go to verse 11. He said, but he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. So Jesus tells them that not everybody can accept the saying, you know, that it's better not to get married. They assume celibacy is the way to go if you are to remain faithful. But Jesus tells them that not everybody can manage celibacy. So let's read in verse 12, he says, for there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. So Jesus reviews the causes where celibacy actually occurs. Some people are like that, genetically so. They're born that way. They have no sexual desire. Okay. I know people, I know a, I know a man, I, I'm not mentioned, but I know a brother in the church, never married, he never married, never had a girlfriend, he's not gay, he's a, he's a quote heterosexual. And I remember talking with him and saying, hey, you, you know, you're, you're in your 30s, your late 30s, you ever think of marriage, blah, blah, blah. He says, you know, I just don't have any need to be married. I don't have the need for a female partner you know, I have no desire actually. I'm quite happy and content. I have my work, I have my studies, I have this, I travel, I do this and that. My service to the church said it gives me a lot of time to, be a, you know, to serve in the church. I teach, I do this and that and so on and so forth. You know, he said, I, I'm good. God has blessed me in such a way that I, you know, I'm not burning in lust, I'm not lonely, I'm, I'm just, I'm a very happy and content person in the Lord without being married. Well, he's a eunuch. He was born that way and, and he's kind of converted that lifestyle into a way of serving the Lord. 
exactly as Paul says you should do if, if, you, if you don't marry. And then he says there are some that are made that way, they're castrated, right? That was a popular thing to do in those days, especially for people who became high officials to the king. They would castrate these people. The eunuch, for example, he was a high official to the, to the, to the royal court so that he would not take over the harem and so on and so forth, mount a challenge to the king, they would, they would be castrated. Right? The jailer, jo Joseph's Potiphar, many believed that he was also a eunuch. And then some of them exercised self-control in order to serve in the kingdom exclusively. And Paul says this is a gift given from God in 1 Corinthians 7. So it's not compulsory since apostles were all married. Paul encouraged people to marry in 1 Corinthians uh, and, and only those who are able should remain single. So in Matthew 19, Jesus combines Genesis, 1 and Deuteron uh, Genesis 2 rather, and Deuteronomy 24 to present the complete will of God concerning marriage and divorce. Okay? So marriage comes from God and the marriage bond is sacred and not to be broken by man. That's the basis. It can be broken by man, but it must not be broken by man. All right? And then if marriage is dissolved for improper cause, in other words, other than sexual immorality, and a person remarries, what's the sin that they've just committed? Well, it's called adultery. And why is it adultery? Because you violated the covenant of marriage in some way. In some way. I mean, I've known marriages where there was no sexual immorality, but the divorce happened anyway. Why? Well, they just they didn't get along. Maybe there was alcohol involved or drugs or you know what I'm saying? It wasn't a sexual sin, but some sin eventually led to the breakup of the relationship. Well, that's breaking the covenant without a proper reason. Because the only reason Jesus says to be able to break the covenant and say I'm innocent is because the partner has committed sexual immorality. Breaking the marriage for any other reason is adultery because you're not allowed to break apart what God has put together. All right, now in Matthew 5, and I want you to stay with me, I may go just a little long tonight, just so much stuff here. Matthew 5, 32, an, a comparable passage. It says, here Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity, same idea, different word, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's a complicated passage because we don't know how to get our heads around that. So the same issue is addressed previously by Jesus except in this passage he, in, he includes another Old Testament scripture, that's Exodus chapter 20 verse 14, which is you shall not commit adultery. Okay? The commandment forbidding adultery as well as Deuteronomy 24, which was the legislation on divorce in relationship to what God wants in marriage. Okay, so this passage in his Sermon on the Mount, because Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, is describing the conduct and character of those within the kingdom. So now the difference between this section and the one in Matthew, what's the difference between Matthew 5 and Matthew 19? It's that here Jesus describes the nature of the trespass or the offense against the innocent spouse and that person's future relationships. In other words, the Jews felt that all obligation to their spouse were over if they obtained a legal document and just gave it to her. They believed that in providing the legal formality, their conscience in the matter was clear. So Jesus demonstrates that the one who divorced without proper cause in that day and time, another sin that they committed was they caused their innocent partners shame. In Matthew 19, Jesus talks about the guilty party. In Matthew 5, the one we've just read, he talks about the innocent party. So Matthew 19, he says, if you divorce your wife other than for sexual sin and marry again, you've committed adultery, you're guilty, boom. In Matthew 5, he's not talking about the guilty party, he's talking about the victim. 
So here we have to examine grammar again in order to get the exact meaning. The Greek word translated makes her commit adultery, that should be translated in the passive tense to bring out what Jesus is trying to say about a man who divorces his innocent wife. It would be clearer in the passive tense so that it would say a man who puts away his innocent wife stigmatizes her as being adulterous. See what I'm saying? So if we use the active tense, then the innocent wife becomes guilty of adultery. And that doesn't make any sense. Listen, whoever puts away his wife, okay, she becomes guilty of adultery? How, did that, how does that happen? <laughs> he's, the, he's the one that committed the adultery. How does the innocent victim also become guilty of adultery? Well, it becomes guilty of adultery if you translate this in the active tense. But if you translate it in the passive tense, okay, then she is the victim of adultery, which makes a whole lot more sense in context. It's not that this woman did anything wrong, but by virtue of her dismissal, she now is seen as being an adulterous person by her society. So this happens to her because the only good reason for her being put away in the first place is sexual immorality. You know, everybody's saying, Oh, you got divorced, there must be something wrong with you. You must have done something bad for your husband to put you away. So if she was innocent and divorced anyways, she would be considered as such, and so would anyone else who would legally marry her in the future. So listen to the sin that these hypocrites do. They put their innocent wives away for no good reason, give her a certificate of divorce, and then go on and marry somebody else or get somebody else. In the meantime, this poor woman here is considered an adulteress by society, and if she marries again, which is the only way she can support herself, you know, you know, the only life that she has is being married to a person. So whoever marries her is also stigmatized as an adulterer. So Jesus is saying to the guilty party, you're not only guilty of adultery because you broke the covenant, you're also guilty of putting your wife to shame and also putting anyone else that she would marry in the future to shame as well. All of this, this is on you. This is on you. So for people in that society who were righteous and moral, a divorced woman was automatically considered to be adulterous. And it's the shameful condition that Jesus is referring to here, falsely created by a wrongful divorce. So in translating, we can use the active or the passive tense, but in using the active tense, what we do is we heap more guilt and suffering on the innocent party. And you know what? That's, that's bad Bible study, and that's not good theology, and that does not square with the gospel. So to say that the innocent partners are guilty or automatically forced into celibacy or adultery, this is not keeping with Jesus' other teachings on grace and forgiveness. Imagine, imagine the victim becomes shamed publicly and has the choice of being shamed for the rest of their life or living a celibate life. Really? <laughs> Doesn't sound like the good news to me. So Jesus in this passage wants to draw out the extent of the sin and the responsibility of the one who is sending away his wife without cause. So Matthew 5.32, okay, what he does is he shows the offense against his partner in causing her public shame and the offense against her future husband in causing him public shame. That's what he's talking about in 5.32. In Matthew 19, he shows the hypocrisy of using only Deuteronomy 24 to judge morality of their actions without considering Genesis chapter two. In other words, they're only looking at it from a legal perspective, they're not looking at what God has said about marriage. And secondly, the only legitimate cause for divorce according to the law was fornication, and to put away a partner for other reasons, this was another wrong. It was called adultery. Okay, one last thing. In Luke chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. So here, Jesus is not 
legislating on divorce or remarriage, he's already explained that in Matthew 5 and in uh, Matthew 19. And he's explained that Matthew's for life, sexual sin is the only legitimate cause for divorce provided by the law, and to divorce without cause does two things. One, it makes one guilty of adultery, and two, it makes one guilty of bringing shame on the innocent party and their future partners. Okay. In Luke 16, Jesus hurls an accusation against the Pharisees who were scoffing at him by charging them with adultery in their careless divorcing and remarrying for any reason, a claim which they were guilty. In other words, they were attacking him at this time here in, Matt, in Luke 16, they were attacking him and the way he responded was simply, he showed them how most of them were guilty in their thinking and their practice of the marriage and divorce in their time. So if Jesus was explaining you know, rules uh, for marriage and divorce and remarriage here, he'd be contradicting the law and his own teaching elsewhere. So he's talking to the Pharisees. What he is reinforcing, however, is that covenant breaking is what constitutes adultery. Okay, one last thing. In Mark chapter 10, verses one to 12, this is another passage that deals with this subject. I'm not going to read it because it covers the same ground as the other passages we've done to tonight, but it does include the mention of a wife putting away her husband. And since that wasn't possible in Jewish society, we're thinking that Mark put that in there because his gospel was probably read a lot by Gentiles and that was happening in Gentile society. Now as for other passages in the New Testament that deal with the issues of marriage and divorce and remarriage, you know, Paul, the apostle, devotes an entire chapter of his first epistle to the Corinthians to this particular subject. I'm not going to do that in this lesson here, but if you're interested in what Paul adds to this discussion, then I encourage you to look at lesson number four entitled Keeping the Lock in Wedlock, and that's in our First Corinthians series, and that of course is available on the BibleTalk.tv website. Okay, uh, next time we get together, we'll do narrative number five. Uh, we've chosen uh, the subject um, tonight, uh, to uh, talk about marriage and divorce because there's so much discussion and debate on it. Uh, I would encourage you to read the rest of the, of the discourse. Uh, next time we're going to be in Matthew 23. We're almost done. We're coming to the end of this, uh, of this uh, series. Okay, well, I hope that's given you some more information about these very difficult passages. This passage here and what we're going to do next time about you know, the, 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 the end of uh, the Jerusalem, you know, the 70 AD, the end of the world, when Jesus will return, pretty complex passages, but hopefully we've uh, shed some light on that. All right, thank you very much.